Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my object, or I should rather say the object I've been engaging with for this project, is um, the death of Seneca, um, a small 17th century red chalk drawing by an unknown Flemish artist. Um, it's quite small, as you can see. If you turn around, it's um, on display over there. Um, it measures only about 34 by 19 centimetres, and it features nothing else besides the figure of Seneca himself. Um, now, this presentation is more um, a record of difficulty which I've been facing rather than a story of success. Um, and the problem for me has been that the death of Seneca is a work of art as well as an artefact, um, a man-made object that has a material dimension apart from its visual appeal and aesthetic value, which I found very difficult to see past, um, and that was compounded um, by the fact that I couldn't touch it because it is a work of art. It's flat, it's two-dimensional, I can't walk around it. If you walk around it, you won't see anything. Um, so these were sort of, the, the, sort of the, in, the inhibitions and the limitations that I faced. Now, material culture, traditionally, as I understand it, has considered objects as part of everyday activities, assuming that everyday life is rooted in the experience of materiality and that the historical study of everyday objects allows access to the lived experience of people in the past. Um, but of course, as a work of art, the death, the death of Seneca doesn't really qualify as an object of everyday use. Um, although I should say this with caution, because it depends on your view of art and what art is supposed to accomplish. Um, I suppose it says more about my own assumptions about art, because my, my immediate reaction was I was walking into an art museum, so what I was going to see was going to be art and couldn't be anything else. So that was my assumption, which I've now been sort of questioning. Um, anyway, so the challenge has been to resist the visual narrative that the work of art communicates and instead to engage with the materiality of the artifact. If meaning is produced through usage, how do we approach objects that are not meant to be used, or primarily, um, that are not meant to be used primarily? My own background is in early modern literature, so I'm very much used to thinking about painting and poetry as sort of sister arts, which accomplish a similar thing, um, which means that if I'm lucky enough to get to talk about objects at all, I tend to treat them as documents, looking for the literal and metaphorical meanings that they give rise to. Confronted with the death of Seneca, my first impulse was to try to interpret the drawing by reading up on the historical Seneca and to contextualise it by looking into its material history, which yielded rather different results. Now, if we were to accept the visual narrative that the drawing projects at face value, what we see is very much what we get, which is a depiction of Seneca the Younger, playwright, statesman and Stoic philosopher, who was born around 4 BC and died AD 65, condemned to commit suicide by his sometime pupil, the Emperor Nero, for his alleged participation in the Pisonian conspiracy. As the drawing suggests, he opened his veins, stepped into a bathtub filled with warm water, and demonstrating stoic indifference to his own fate, waited for the end. Now, the drawing captures this moment, although it presents a highly sanitised vision of martyrdom, as I find. There are no gushing rivers of blood, there's no suggestion of violence done to the dying man's body, um, which is extraordinarily well-toned, as you can see, for an old man. Um, this is death uh, transfigured into an aesthetic and a philosophically profound experience. Uh, however, the drawing's material history reveals a rather different story, which complicates its visual narrative. The death of Seneca came to the UCL Art Museum as part of the Grote bequest in 1872, a collection of artworks traceable to the 17th century Netherlands, which contains a large number of drawings, many of them believed to be copies of prints. It is one of three works that address the subject of Seneca in the collection, the others being Cornelius um, Galles, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, The Elders, The Death of Seneca, which is an engraving, and Lucas Vosterman's 1638 portrait of Seneca, also an engraving. Now, both Galley's engraving and my drawing are modelled on an oil painting by Peter Paul Rubens, also entitled The Death of Seneca. Um, placing them side by side opens up a whole new perspective on the material history of the drawing I've been looking at, reflecting on the processes of interpretation and aestheticisation whereby objects are invested with meanings, meanings that often fail to take stock of their historical context by privileging visuality over materiality, um, and which also speaks to what Simon said earlier about um, intersections and relationships between objects, that objects don't exist in a vacuum. Um, and which also says something about my own desire to construct a narrative 
that moves forward in a way, so, as you can see. Um, so briefly, it seems that Rubens commissioned Galli to produce an engraving of his oil painting, which he did, which is the second one on the left, um, which then proliferated and gave rise to several variations. My drawing quite clearly represents a copy of one of the more pared-down versions of Galli's engraving, suggesting that we're talking about a drawing exercise rather than a finished work of art. And that in turn suggests that it may be an object of everyday use after all, because it had an educational and a didactic purpose. And I think now it has been repurposed to form part of the UCL anatomy teaching pack, so it's sort of returned to its roots in the, sort of, in the classroom, which is rather nice. Um, as an interesting aside, and without wanting to read too much into this, you can actually see that during the initial engraving process, the figure of Seneca seems to have been turned around. You can see that he's having his left hand there, and he's been turned around, so he was raising his right hand, now he's raising his left hand, which happens during engraving. Um, this suggests that the material processes responsible for the production of the object have substantially altered the artwork, telling their very own particular story about artistic agency in the first age of the mechanically reproducible work of art. Going back in time even further, one discovers that Rubens himself drew inspiration from a black marble statue, now known as the Black Fisherman, <clears throat> which had been discovered on Mount Esquiline in Rome around 1594. We had, which he had seen on display in the gardens of the Villa Borghese. Um, and this is the copy itself. This is the second century Roman copy of a Hellenistic original. And it was in the Borghese collection. It's now at the Louvre. At the time, and I don't know why, the statue was erroneously identified as the dying Seneca, which is presumably why it appealed to Rubens, who had a lasting and documented interest in the contemporary revival of Stoicism led by the Flemish humanist Justus Lipsius, whose disciple he was. And here's Rubens, uh, the four philosophers. There's Seneca up there um, presiding over proceedings. Rubens on the left, his brother, who's extraordinarily good looking. Um, Lipsius, very richly dressed in the middle, and another gentleman, I don't know who that is. And Lipsius' dog, Mopsilus, which, you know, stoic or no stoic, which suggests that the man had an exquisite sense of humor. Um, but going back to the statue, uh, this added piece of material context suggests two things. One, that technically my death of Seneca isn't a drawing of Seneca at all, uh, which complicates any traditional reading thereof one might be prompted to attempt by judging it on its visual and aesthetic appeal alone. And two, it demonstrates quite clearly that artists are always also consumers of art and that it is the consumption of art that produces new meanings, giving rise to new artefacts and to new lines of interpretation. To Rubens, it seems, the statue of the black fisherman has value only in so far as it can be made to reflect a preconceived um, narrative of um, Stoic philosophy. And in a sense, it is his philosophical bias that has coloured not only the artistic afterlife of the motif across different media, but also our response to the drawing today. And to conclude... I think that the material history of this death of Seneca prompts us to ask new research questions not only about the relationship between visuality and materiality, about objects and their historical context, but also about historical processes of interpretation that invariably seem to influence our own. How do the material practices that inform the creation of visual artefacts mediate, limit or enhance our perceptions of and interactions with them? Is it at all possible to approach historical objects in an unbiased way, and is that desirable? And glancing towards curatorial issues, the dying Seneca's journey through time, space, and across different artistic media also prompts us to ask about the value judgments and perceptions, both historical and contemporary, that determine if and how objects become works of art, and vice versa. I suppose ultimately, and sorry I couldn't resist this, um, I suppose what I want to know is how do we get sort of the visual and the material to, to shake hands? How, my, my problem was very much that I couldn't get past the visual at the material. I, I, I found myself very much excluded from the object by its visual qualities, if that makes sense. So how do we get them to shake hands? Thank you.